Welcome to the ABC of Cardiology series. Today's uh, letter is D. D is for diastolic dysfunction. A lot of people have written to me and said, can you please explain diastolic dysfunction? So here goes. The first thing is that the heart is a pump. It has to relax and fill with blood, and then it has to push that blood out. The time interval during which it is pushing the blood out is called systole. The time interval during which the heart is relaxing to fill with blood is called diastole. For many years, the ability of the heart is measured by its ability to push blood out. And this is best ascertained by a test called echocardiography, ultrasound of the heart. Those patients who have hearts which are not able to push as much blood out of the heart uh, are termed as having systolic dysfunction. They cannot contract as well and therefore the blood isn't coming out. So they are termed as patients having systolic dysfunction. And it is well recognized that patients who have systolic dysfunction don't seem to have as good a quality of life or the same life expectancy as patients who have normal hearts or who have not got systolic dysfunction. In search for identifying people at risk of developing systolic dysfunction as early in the disease process as possible, people started realizing that how much blood the heart pumps out during systole is very dependent on how much blood fills the heart during diastole. In conditions like high blood pressure, what we've started realizing is that you know, a lot of patients who had developed left ventricular systolic dysfunction actually had high blood pressure previously. So people started looking at these patients and what they started finding was that actually before these patients started developing left ventricular systolic dysfunction, they were starting to develop a problem with the relaxation part of the heart cycle. So the heart was not relaxing enough and because the heart was not relaxing enough, it was filling with less blood and therefore less blood was being pumped out during systole. And they termed this impaired relaxation of the heart diastolic dysfunction. So now what has happened is people start terming them as, oh, you've got systolic dysfunction and if your heart looks fine and it's pumping well, but for some reason they think that the heart is not as relaxing as well, then they call it diastolic dysfunction. And people have mistakenly started thinking that these are two separate things. The truth is that there is no such thing as isolated diastolic dysfunction, although a lot of doctors seem to think there is. Systole, which is when the heart contracts, and diastole, when the heart relaxes, are both two phases of the same cardiac cycle. So it is impossible for you to affect one and not affect the other. It is the same as saying, well, okay, the, if I fill with blood, that is obviously going to have an impact on how well my heart contracts. This is called Starling's Law. The more you stretch the heart up to a certain point, the more vigorous the contraction of the heart. The more you fill the heart with the blood in diastole, the more effective the contraction. So people say, well, okay, in diastolic dysfunction, what's happening is the heart is not able to fill with as much blood. Of course, if the heart is not able to fill with as much blood, it is going to affect systole during which how much blood is being pumped out. The problem is, at this point in time, the techniques we have to measure systolic dysfunction are crude. So we look at echocardiography, which is a two-dimensional imaging modality trying to study a three-dimensional, very complex structure. So on echo, if, look, if it looks that the heart is pumping well, people say, okay, that systolic function is normal. We think this person has diastolic dysfunction because we think it's difficult for the heart to relax. The truth is everyone who has diastolic dysfunction also has systolic dysfunction, but yes, echocardiographically, we only detect those people who have really significant systolic dysfunction. So we're picking those people up. But increasingly it's become apparent that diastolic dysfunction, which can be picked up is often a precursor to developing overt echocardiographic systolic dysfunction. And if you are found to have diastolic dysfunction, then it makes good sense to try and treat it or try and do those things that may have contributed to it in the first place. Those things are things like uh, weight loss, regular exercise, making sure you're sleeping well, making sure your stress levels are down at all times, keeping blood pressure well controlled, uh, losing weight, etc. Now, what is really interesting is 
the last time when we were doing the ABC series, I talked about BNP and how BNP is an interesting blood test which tells us if it's harder for the heart to pump blood out. And in this setting, BNP is very useful because, as I say, echocardiographically, you can only pick up those people who have very severe systolic dysfunction. But BNP will tell you the blood test will go up when you have diastolic dysfunction because the heart is struggling to fill with blood. The pressures inside it are going to be high and the BNP tends to go up also in patients with diastolic dysfunction. So I hope you found this useful. Thank you.